Welcome to lecture 20 in our class on stochastic processes. Today we will finish the basic construction of the stochastic integral in the sense of Ito. So we will list several properties of the stochastic integral and we will finally make the connection to our naive idea of something like a Stieltjes integral that the stochastic integral should be in the end. And that will become clear in the course of this lecture. Uh, recall that in the last session we introduced the stochastic integral basically through uh, an application of the Ries representation theorem where we made essential use of the fact that a martingale, a continuous martingale, has a quadratic variation process. And today we want to construct, before we, before we actually connect to our intuitive uh, object that we would like to have as a stochastic integral, before we do that we would like to extend the collection of processes which can serve as an integrator, so as a martingale, to, against which we want to do the integration. And we also want to extend the class of processes X, which can be integrated, uh, to a maximally wide class in each case, in order to have um, a reasonable amount of flexibility. Um, okay, and the first proposition does already do a significant step in the extension of the stochastic integral to more general integrands and integrators. So the proposition goes like this. If we do have a filtered probability space, where the filtration, as we shall always assume, of course, is indexed by the continuous non-negative time axis, and given the local martingale, which we always assume that it is a martingale or a local martingale with continuous paths, and let x be a measurable and bounded process. So bounded means that there is a universal constant which uh, is an upper bound and absolute value to all possible realizations of these random variables x. Then there exists a unique local martingale which shall still be denoted with this dot notation. So there's a unique local martingale which starts in zero and which has the property that for any other local martingale n, which we consider as a test martingale, if we uh, consider the joint variation, so the, the co-bracket or the co-variation of that object x dot m with that test martingale n, then this allows for an interpretation in terms of a Stieltjes integral, namely it is then the, inti um, the um, integrand x process, the x process, pathwise integrated in the sense of a Stieltjes integral against the joint bracket of the initial uh, to local martingale M and the test martingale N. So I'm saying, and let me say it again, that whenever we have a local martingale M and we have a measurable and bounded process, then there is a unique new local martingale, which we shall denote by X dot M, and which is characterized by only these two properties, that it starts in zero and that its co-bracket, so its joint quadratic variation with any other local martingale, is given through this formula on the right-hand side, which involves a classical pathwise Stieltjes integral, where the Stieltjes integral is taken with respect to the process of bounded variation, which is the joint bracket of, or the co-bracket of the M in the N process. So if you compare this to the um, basically final result of the previous session, where we, um, where we assume that the process M essentially is a martingale from the class of square integrable martingales, and that the process X would be something like an L2 integrable random uh, process with respect to the square integral. In this step, we make a, in this lemma or proposition, we make a major extension in the possibility to construct a stochastic integral not only from L2 bounded martingales, but even local martingales, which do not necessarily have to be martingales in their own right. But we already saw last time that the notion of a bracket for local martingales is available. It is available for local martingales. So that's why we have the possibility to use these brackets uh, for the characterization as it is given in this proposition. Okay. As for uniqueness, so here I want to start the proof now. So as for uniqueness of such a process XM, uh, that's clear because if we have such a representation, we could, for instance, also uh, take two of those processes which serve, or which satisfy this inequality, and test this difference of these two processes, which could be candidates, 
with uh, n being the, the difference, so which would mean it's the same argument that had we, we discussed before, that we would have a local martingale uh, whose bracket is zero, that clearly says that this local martingale must be the zero process right away if that process starts from zero. So therefore the uniqueness is a very simple uh, is a very simple statement, a very simple consequence. So what we need to check here effectively in this uh, proposition or in the lemma is that there is such a process. Okay, and we do it by localization, of course. Localization is the procedure that you apply when you want to in, um, study general processes, but you study the general processes by f using an appropriate sequence of stopping times in order to convert every, all these stochastic processes basically in, into bounded processes. Uh, in which case you have all these uh, functional analysis and Hilbert spaces and so forth at your disposal. So since we assume that the process M that we were starting with, or that the integrator, is a local martingale, we have a, by definition of local martingales, we have a stopping time, a sequence of stopping times tau k, such that they converge or diverge to infinity in a monotone fashion point-wise, and such that the corresponding stopped um, M process with each of those stopping times tau k is a proper martingale. And in order to make sure that we really deal with bounded processes, we uh, stop, if you like, this stop process again. We introduce the even a re reduction or is even a smaller sequence of stopping times, which is the infimum of the old stopping times tau k, which is uh, yet stopped another time the first moment when this M process, the initial M process, exceeds the level K. And so if we stop then the process M not only at take, take the old stopping time tau K, but tau K prime, by this additional stopping, we make sure that the process M tau K prime is never above uh, the level K in absolute value. So in particular, it's in fact an L2 bounded martingale and since in the proposition we want to assume that X is a bounded process, it will automatically then be also a process which is integrable with respect, or it's an L2 integrable process with respect to this martingale, which is also bounded. Okay, and now I want to, of course, I want to argue that I have a sequence of processes which um, are consistent and that I can actually uh, define a proper limit. So let me therefore consider the case when I have two of such stopping times and for, e for each of those stopping times tau k prime and so forth I can now consider just uh, by using what we have understood so far the situation of an L2 square integral martingale I can consider the martingale which is obtained by taking the abstract uh, stochastic integral with respect to this stopped martingale with stopping level k plus 1 using this additionally stop, stopping times tau prime. And uh, I can now uh, stop this, this martingale as a process by means of the stopping time tau k prime, which is one level below, if you like. And I, take the, I can take the bracket with any other test martingale or even square integral martingale in this case. Now, we have seen in the uh, in the discussion of the bracket process, that if I insert or if I stop, oh, sorry, if I take the bracket of two processes, uh, one of which is stopped by means of a stopping time, then this joint bracket of the stopped thing with the test, whatever the other factor in this co-bracket is, this is just as good if I had taken the unstopped two components, the unstopped two martingales, and had stopped the bracket process of the unstopped martingale by means of the same stopping time. If you not, uh, if you don't remember so well this equality, then you can just use the, prop, the the fact that the bracket process can be obtained, for instance. Uh, by uh, summing up these uh, increments uh, in local in uh, which is a proper limit in probability locally uniformly in time 
and then you will immediately see that this relation is true. Okay, so this is the first step. Then um, I recall that this bracket process, again by the characterization of this abstract stochastic integral, this bracket process of this dot object with another test martingale in, this bracket process is, can be written by means of a Stieltis integral. This is just our fundamental characterization of this new dot product process. And of course, this whole process, as we had seen here before, is then also subject to a stopping procedure. And I should probably um, <clears throat> explain my notation here. So if I write just a, a big dot here, okay, a big dot can have, in fact, two meanings, I should say. Either a big dot stands for the symbol of our abstract stochastic integral, or a big dot, in most of the cases, almost just as many times, stands for a time variable, which I don't want to write in an explicit fashion. Okay, so let me say it again. So this bracket process, as a... As a stochastic processes which deals with trajectories is the process which is obtained by taking the Stieltis integral of the X process with respect to this bracket of M as in uh, M process stopped at topping to stopping time tau k parameters one and the N process and this whole process is subject to a stopping by uh, uh, yeah, just by, by the fact that we want to apply the stopping to this uh, bracket process. Okay, we just, in fact, have just inserted this representation of the bracket process. Okay, now we apply again uh, the previous uh, argument that if we take a bracket of two processes where one of the two is a stop process, then this is just as good as if we had computed the bracket of the non-stop processes and then had just uh, stopped the bracket process. So in, 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 a, in, a, in a way, I'm just pulling this stopping operation outside of the bracket. And I'm doing this inside the Stieltis integral. So what I want to say is that this, this function here is the same as this function, and therefore also the Stieltis integral that I compute pathwise with, reg with regards to this, these two functions, or so this function is the same. Now, if I, what, what does it mean to stop this, what does it mean, sorry, to <clears throat> take the Stieltis integral with respect to a certain function which is at a stopped at a certain time? This means that the process doesn't change its value, the function with, res re with respect to which I do the Stieltis integral does not change in value after the stopping time, which is uh, written up here, which means that there is nothing to add or no, no further contribution from anything uh, after time, which is the stopping time. So therefore, the integral with respect to a, the Stieltis integral with respect to a stopped function is just as good as if I had taken the Stieltis integral with respect to the non-stop function, but only up to that moment of time when the stopping kicks in, it kicks in for the first time. This is what is expressed in this notation. So in other words, the values of the Stieltis integral when this time index, which is written here, exceeds the stopping time tau k plus one prime, the value of this Stieltis integral does not change any, any longer once the time heat, which I could enter here, is exceeding this stopping time because there is no more increment which is added or if you like the Stieltis measure is just a zero measure after all times after which uh, which lie after the stopping time tau cap from okay and again I'm stopping this function of the uh, of the of the upper boundary of the integration I'm stopping this function at stopping time tau k prime, which was the exterior stopping, which was still there all the time. And uh, this means, again, that this stopping, uh, that this function which is inside the, um, or the, that this Stieltis integral is taken maximally up to the infimum of the two stopping times, tau k plus one prime and tau k prime. Because, again, the stopping does, 
uh, effectively produce that the value of the corresponding trajectory does not change, and this is equally achieved by just performing this TGS integral up to the infimum of the two uh, boundary values, or the two stopping times, tau k prime and tau k plus one prime. But of course tau k prime is less or equal than tau k prime plus one, so therefore this infimum, pointwise infimum, is just, just as good as taking the infimum with respect to tau k prime. And now I can unwind or just undo all these uh, manipulations uh, back again, but this time there's only one stopping time which is appearing in these arguments, so I'm just unwinding all these arguments again, I'm writing this uh, Stieltis integral just as good, I can write it as a Stieltis integral with respect to the bracket process where uh, the M process, for instance, is stopped by means of the stopping time tau k prime and again, M tau k prime this is again an element from the the space of square integral martingales, so uh, by the very definition or the very characterization of the abstract E2 or stochastic integral, I know that this uh, this bracket, this is the bracket uh, uh, of, of this uh, of this uh, abstract E2 integral. Okay, and what does this tell me in the end? If I compare the two expressions that I started with and they end up with, so let me do that. So I started with the abstract stochastic integral of the X process with respect to the M martingale, which was stopped at the later moment, and I stop it, I consider it only up to the previous level of previous time, which corresponds to the previous stopping time, and what I find is that this process, if I take it into the bracket with an abstract, with a general N martingale, with a general martingale, which serves as a test martingale, I see that this bracket is just the same as if I had inserted on the left-hand side this simplified process, which tells me, since the brackets are the same with regards to all possible test martingales n, that these two processes must be the same. Okay, that was probably a long, um, a long justification for an equality which is probably intuitive, but not so if you just have this abstract construction at your disposal. It says that if you want to consider the stochastic integral with respect to a martingale which is obtained by considering a process and stopping it later, but restricting all this process to times where the stopping time has not yet, the later stopping time has not yet kicked in, what you see is exactly the trajectories that uh, are obtained by taking this abstract stochastic integral of the same X process, but with the same martingale, but stopped at the earlier time. Which, uh, in particular, means that, uh, by, the, by a very similar um, consideration as we were, uh, do, uh, we, that we were doing in the context of the bracket process for local martingales, it means that on each of these growing time intervals, which um, correspond to this increasing sequence of stopping times, I have always the same trajectories. I have a consistent family of trajectories, which means that if I fix a certain fixed time t, once the stopping time tau k prime is above t, uh, all these processes that I might observe for different le stopping levels tau k prime for large enough k prime will have the same value. And so I can define in an unambiguous fashion the value of a certain process, which I then call x dot m at time t, which is just the level, which is just uh, the, the, the limit of these uh, trajectories evaluated at fixed time t for these sequence of stopped abstract integrations. <clears throat> and we see that this is a well-defined quantity because once the stopping time tau k is above the level t, then all these values here will be con will be constant um, in terms uh, with regards to this index k. So therefore, this limit exists, and we have a well-defined random variable in the end at level t at time t. 
Okay, that's good. That defines a process. And what we have to show, in fact, is that this is uh, that this is uh, the object uh, which we want to have. Then we want to show that this is a local martingale. That's obviously true because we have obtained the local martingale. This process x dot m by a sequence of um, martingales, which were stopped martingales of the same object, so it's clearly a local martingale. And what we want to show is that uh, this process, x dot m, has the right bracket process with all possible uh, test local martingales n. That remains to be shown. But it, okay, what I have forgotten to say is we also had to show that this process starts in zero, but this is by the definition of the stochastic integral, each of these approximating or sequence of these x dot m tau k processes is starting in zero, and so therefore also the limit is starting in zero. Okay, so we need to show that for all possible test local martingales in this newly defined x dot m process, which is a local martingale, that this uh, the bracket process of the n with that x dot m process has the representation as required. Now, <clears throat> m, correction, n is a local martingale, so by definition we have a localizing, as we call it, sequence, which is called sigma k, let's, which is the localizing sequence for this, uh, for this local martingale, n. And uh, recall that we had these stopping signs tau k prime from the previous um, consideration, so we take eta k to be the infimum or the minimum of this stopping time tau k prime and sigma k, which will be again a stopping time and which is made in such a fashion that if we stop both m and x dot m with the stopping time eta k, then both will be martingales. Okay, and what uh, can we say about these um, these stopped processes? Well, um, since... Um, well. <clears throat> By our representation of the quadratic variation that comes with the abstract definition of the dot process, we know that these stopped processes, they are even uh, martingales, and uh, we can probably even assume that the both are, um, say, uh, L2 bounded martingales, then <clears throat> We know by the characterization of this abstract integral that this joint variation of this process with that process is given by this TGS integral of the X process with respect to the bracket which comes from M and N. And that's just true as long as we stop properly. So therefore this is a martingale. But uh, obviously this product process stopped at eta k minus the state integral, which is also stopped at eta k. This is nothing but the product process minus the state integral stopped at eta k, which just says what we want to show, namely that if we subtract from this product process the corresponding state integral, then we obtain a local martingale. And this is just uh, the characterization of the, of the bracket process. If we recall that um, for a martingale or even for a local martingale, there is only at most, and in fact there is one uniquely defined process of bounded variation which starts in zero and which compensates the square of this martingale or the product of two different martingales and which is exactly the bracket process. And, uh, since there's only one that does the compensation, we can say that the bracket process of these two uh, local martingales must be, in fact, the Stichens integral, because this is the thing that gives, upon subtraction, the local martingale. So therefore we see that, in fact, um, this process which we have obtained by a pointwise limit of x dot m tau k prime, where tau k is a, or tau k is a sequence of stopping terms, is in fact the object that we were asking for. Okay, so this concludes the proof of this 
theorem, which is probably surprisingly complicated, but it comes from the fact that we were starting all this from a very abstract definition of a stochastic integral. And I promise at the end of this session, uh, you will probably no longer need this very abstract definition of a stochastic integral because it will show that in most of the cases that are interesting for us, we have a, um, a, a more intuitive um, approximation or a representation of the stochastic integral. Okay, we want to make one more step in generalization, namely we want to get rid of the assumption that we still have in the previous proposition that the X process, so the integrand, is bounded. And the concept that we will use is the concept of a locally bounded integrand process. And for that purpose, we want to make sure uh, we want to have one more little lemma, which uh, I leave as an exercise. Namely, let X be a measurable and bounded process. So, a process of the type that we were dealing with in the previous proposition as an integrand. And let T be a stopping time. And let M be a local martingale. Then, of course, if we multiply the previous process x with just an indicator function for the interval from 0 to t, so that's an indicator function which is applying to the t variable, then this new object here is again a measurable random variable in the two variables t and omega, so it's still a measurable process, and of course it's also a bounded process because we have made it at most smaller, and we can construct by the previous proposition the stochastic integral of this new X process with respect to the local martingale M. And the claim here is that this is just the same as if we had integrated the X process with respect to the stopped martingale. And that's the same as if we had integrated the X process with respect to the non-stopped martingale, but stopped the whole thing. Uh, so I want to leave this, the proof of this property as an exercise. I think it's on the next problem sheet even. Uh, but why is that again intuitive? Well, the Stieltjes integral with respect of the Stieltjes integral of, of, of any function with respect to a certain integrator m in this case. So, does not change its value when the integrand has zero value after a certain moment of time t. And that means that the Stieltjes integral does not add up value when time passes this level. And that's why uh, these two statements are intuitively clear. So if we really think of this dot m operation as a Stieltjes integral, then this the sequence of equalities is intuitively clear and it can be, in fact, deduced uh, by the abstract representation that we have for this stochastic integral. Okay, so instead of integrating a process with respect to a martingale, say, or local martingale, and stopping the whole thing, you can equivalently multiply the integrand with an indicator function of the time interval that corresponds to uh, that period of time when the stopping does not yet kick in. Okay, and this property will be uh, the property that we want to exploit for the extension of the stochastic integral to cases when the integrands are not really bounded, but only locally bounded, which is a concept that we introduce now, namely we if we have a measurable process, then the process X is called locally bounded. If we find a sequence of stopping times which diverge to infinity almost surely, such that the corresponding set of the corresponding stochastic process which is obtained by multiplying the X process with this indicator is in fact a bounded process. And for instance, for a process X with continuous trajectories, which starts in zero, for instance, then this will be clearly a locally bounded process, for instance. And um, combining uh, the previous 
problema about the integration of a of an integrant which comes with an indicator function with, re with regards to time and our knowledge about how to integrate a bounded process against a given local martingale, we now have the following corollary, namely that x be a measurable and locally bounded process, which we want to, to use as an integrand, and there exists a unique process which we call x dot m, which is a local martingale, which starts at zero, and it has the property that if we take the bracket of that new object x dot m against another local martingale, we have the typical Stilchius representation. Okay, uh, that is follows in exactly the same lines, the existence of this process, and that um, it has the right expression for the bracket. It follows exactly in the same line, in the same line of argument, as we had just in for the case when we were extending the stochastic integral Uh, from a, a smaller class of M processes to a larger class of M processes by doing this consistent limit. And this consistent limit argument will be exactly applicable also to the case when we do this not stopping, but if you want, um, uh, yeah, probably squashing or something of the X process with respect to time. So that's probably something that you could call the squashed process X. So the squashing the, the integrand process is just as good as stopping the integrator process. That's what it says. And then after that, the argument for the construction of a uh, stochastic integral for even non-bounded but locally bounded X process is just the same. So therefore, I leave that as an exercise. Okay, that's very good. So we now have basically... Um, concept of a stochastic integral which is certainly big enough and good enough and wide enough for everything that remains for us uh, to be considered in the remaining few lectures. So let me say it again, we have the possibility to take a process X which is measurable and locally bounded and we take a, another process M which is a local martingale and we have an operation which produces a new stochastic process, which at this moment of time has just an abstract construction. We call that process the x dot m process, or the abstract stochastic integral. And we want now finally to connect this to our initial naive wish and desire to identify this thing as some version of a Stilchius integral. And this will be done now. Namely, let omega f be a filtered probability space as before with continuous time. Then we want to consider the, case, the class of elementary predictable processes. Elementary predictable processes as follows. Let me, a process is considered to be elementary predictable if it has the representation or if it is in fact piecewise constant in time Where we, uh, where we have effectively a time grid on the time axis, we have a grid on the time axis of, uh, which is given by a sequence of times, deterministic times ti and ti plus one and so forth. And we consider this um, partition of the real line, the non-negative real line, into these half open time intervals. And so this is meant to say that the process xt is piecewise constant with respect to the time variable. So it makes jumps only in the transition uh, from one of those time intervals to the next time interval. And in between, or on the interior of one of those time intervals, ti until ti plus one, since it is constant, all the, all the dependence of the function x t and omega is, remains in omega. So if you like, this is with respect to t, and this is with respect to omega. So on each of these time intervals, from ti to ti plus 1, the left open, right closed time intervals, the process, the value actually of this process is given by a certain random variable xi, and now comes an important point. We want to require that this random variable xi is measurable with respect to the sigma field, which is corresponding to the 
left boundary point of that time interval. So each of these xi's is FTI measurable. Yes, so any such process is called an elementary predictable process. Why is this called predictable? Well, it is called predictable because on the interval from Ti to Ti plus 1, the actual value of this stochastic process is determined already through the sigma field, which belongs to the left boundary point of this interval. So what does this mean? It means that if you want to ask what's the value of this process at the time point Ti plus 1, for instance, then this is, since this is continuous with respect to the time parameter from the left, you can say that on the interior and also on the boundary of this, on the right boundary of this interval, the process, the value of the process is already determined by the information that we have at the beginning of this interval. So therefore, on each of these half-open intervals, the exact level of the X process is already determined by what we know at the beginning of the corresponding interval. In that respect, the process is predictable. And a sequence a correction, and a, correct, a process X, now a general process, is called predictable, not necessarily elementary predictable, if we have a sequence of elementary predictable processes, so of processes which are in fact piecewise constant with respect to the time variable, which then and which are additionally predictably piecewise constant with respect to the time variable. So a process X is called predictable if we find a sequence of, and here's a misprint, we find a sequence of elementary predictable processes such that for any pair T and omega, the value of the process X can be approximated or is approximated by the corresponding sequence of values of this sequence of predictable elementary processes at those times t, uh, at the time t and in uh, random parameter omega. So a, a pointwise limit of an elementary, of a sequence of elementary predictable processes is by definition a predictable process. And as a little proposition that you can prove easily by yourself, we find that every process which has left continuous paths is predictable. That's exactly uh, what you would think of, namely that the process does not produce any kind of surprise when you observe the trajectories and you want to compute the value of the trajectory at a certain time, you can approximate the value very well from the left by just observing the trajectory. So it doesn't produce any jump, unexpected jump, uh, which produces a discontinuity uh, from the left. So therefore, any process with continuous paths would be what you would intuitively suggest as a predictable process, and uh, it's a simple exercise to show that if you have left continuity of paths, then the process is predictable. All oh, right, so it has left continuous path, and I should also say it is adapted, of course. So that's probably something I should add here because else it wouldn't be true. And adapted, of course. Adapted to the filtration F. Uh, if, so if the process is left continuous and adapted, then X is predictable. All right. And now comes the proposition that with finally connects our abstract notion of a stochastic integral with our intuitive uh, wish object, so to say, that the stochastic integral should be. Namely, if we have a process which is in fact an elementary predictable process, and if we have a continuous local martingale, then the stochastic integral that, of course, we can perform 
using x as an integrand and m as an integrator at any time s is exactly the Stieltjes integral or the yes the the Stieltjes integral that would correspond to taking the Stieltjes integral with respect to time of this piecewise constant in time process with regards to the increments that the m process is exhibiting on these uh, respective time intervals. Namely, the x dot m process, which is our abstract stochastic integral, evaluated at any time, is just the sum of all these xi values of the x process multiplied with the increments of the m process on the corresponding uh, time intervals. Of course, we take this increment of this m process only as long as the intervals lie uh, well below uh, the threshold number s until which or up to which we want to compute this Stieltjes integral. So let me say that again. So in case when the process x, which is supposed to be integrated against the process m, as long as the process x is in fact locally constant in time, then our abstract stochastic integral with respect to the martingale is in fact exactly the Stieltjes integral that we would obtain if we did uh, the integral for that process against the M process. Note that we can, in fact, talk of the Stieltjes integral in this case, in a way, because the function which we want to integrate in this case, in the X process, is so easy with, re with regards to the time parameter. So this proposition... <clears throat> is very important and is very good news because it says that our abstract notion of stochastic integral that we have invested in so much over the last two sessions or so, that our abstract notion of a stochastic integral is fully consistent with our desire to construct a generalization of a Stieltjes integral, which is the proper object we want to study in, situ in very simple situations. And if you recall uh, the introduction that we did into this chapter of the lecture regarding this total losses or win wins that come along with the portfolio strategy, if M is the Brownian motion here, so if we write instead a B here, and the XI is just the theta, is just the amount of stock we uh, own at a certain in a certain interval, then this is exactly this uh, uh, finite sum of gains and losses which we have to uh, aggregate for each of these respective time intervals. So it's exactly the this um, weighted increments of the B process or the M process multiplied with the value of theta i. And the theta i, the predictability of theta i here tells us that I have made my choice at the beginning of these, each of those intervals, ti, how much stock I shall carry on the corresponding uh, macroscopic time interval. And I need to make uh, this choice according to, for that interval, according to the information that was available at the beginning of this interval. So from a financial mathematics point of view, the notion of predictability for processes here is very natural and is exactly the notion that corresponds to the absence of insider trading. So predictability here means that um, the amount of stock that I want to carry in one of those intervals needs to be determined by using the information that is available at the very beginning of this interval only. Okay, and the proposition, let me say it again, tells us that our very abstract concept of stochastic integral, in the case of simple, predictable processes, coincides perfectly with our um, naive first approach to the construction of this uh, stochastic integral. Okay.
Okay, so if we want to prove that statement, we have to do show uh, uh, two things. Then we have to show that this process as a process in the time parameter S is in fact a martingale, or a local martingale, say, and that this, this uh, process as a local martingale has the right bracket in terms of this Stevens formula that characterizes our abstract stochastic integral when we test against arbitrary um, test local martingales n. Okay, so we have to do two things, show that this thing here is a martingale and that it has the right code bracket or joint bracket with another process which, which can be arbitrary. Okay, so for a moment let us assume that, just for simplicity, that the process m against we integrate is in fact a square integral martingale, and let us also assume that the process x is in fact bounded. And by stopping or so, we can basically always assume that this is the case because uh, we can unwind any stopping for the terminal statement because it's a statement about local martingales in the end. Okay, first step is to show that this object that we have here on the right hand side is in fact a martingale, and for that purpose, we just write this object on the right hand side. Out again. So it's just this sum of weighted increments of the M process when we multiply each of those weighted increments with the corresponding xi value on the subinterval. And for simplicity, I want to show only one case of this martingale equalities, of this family of martingale equalities, which I have to show. Namely, I want to consider the simple case or the special case when I take the Z process, add one of those grid points tk plus 1 and want to compute its condition expectation uh, given the sigma field that corresponds to the next grid point below. In fact, I have to consider for the full proof of the multiple probability, I have to pr do such a consideration for all possible times s and t, uh, but I want to, to avoid this now. I just want to show you the, the, the central argument leaving in some of the details to you. Okay, so <clears throat> this Z process at time TK plus 1, this is the case when um, all the summons which uh, belong to indices uh, I greater than K plus 2 or so vanish by this uh, case when S equals um, TK plus 1. So therefore, the Z process has only... Um, all these sums up to index k, and I separate this sum into the sums of the summons up to level um, less, strictly less than k. This is one part of this sum which appears in the definition of the z process, and we have the last summon which is non-zero in the definition of the z process, which I evaluate here at tk plus one, which is the increment on the last interval, which has ZK, TK plus 1 as, as right boundary point, and that's the TK plus 1 increment of M to the TK point of, of M, multiplied with the value of the X process at uh, time point TK. Okay, now the first uh, condition expectation of the first sum is uh, since the is is uh, contains only random variables which are measurable with respect to the sigma field uh, at the time tau k at tk. So therefore, the condition expectation on these first summons is uh, the identity operation, and nothing will here change. And now comes this important um, essential argument here in the computation of this remaining term, I have the condition expectation of the product, which involves the increment, and the xk process, the xk random variable. But by definition of predictability, this xk random variable is measurable with respect to the sigma field ftk. So therefore, it goes in front of the condition expectation as just a factor, and what remains is the condition increment of the M process, given the sigma field Ftk, and of course this is zero because M is a martingale. 
And so what remains from this conditional expectation is just the sum of all the summons, or just the, yes, the sum that involves all the summons for level i strictly less than k, but by definition of the z process, this is exactly the z process evaluated at time tk. So we see that in fact, uh, at least when I check for the martingale inequality on this discrete collection of time grid points, then I can uh, recover, I can um, prove this martingale property. And the critical, uh, the critical property or the critical condition which allowed me to do so was the predictability of this X process, which tells me that the XK at each level is, predict is, is measurable with respect to the sigma field on which on each of those levels I do the conditional expectation. And, uh, of course, I have to check uh, many more of those uh, equalities, and namely for um, general continuous times S and T. I need to convince myself that this equality is correct, but uh, the mechanics of the proof is exactly the same. So, in fact, this uh, sketches why it's true, actually, that the Z process is a matic. Okay, what I need to show us next is that, for in general... Suppose square integrable martingale n, the, uh, this z process, the z process, this, the bracket of the z process with this n process has the right expression, has the right Stitches integral expression. And for that purpose, I write down what the Stitches integral in this case would actually be. And it, suppose I take an arbitrary square integrable martingale and I compute the bracket process of the integrator m with that test martingale n and then I do this Stitches integral of the x process with respect to this bracket. Then by the fact that x is piecewise constant in time, the Stilges integral is again just a linear combination of increments of the corresponding integrator in this case. The integrator here is just the, the, the co-bracket process of m and n. And I need to evaluate the increments of this co-bracket process on the corresponding uh, boundary points of those time intervals where the X process is constant. I need to multiply then each of those increments with the corresponding value of the X process that is the right value on, the, on that interval. So again, by the very here, this is really just nothing but writing out <clears throat> the very definition of the Stilges integral, of the pathwise Stilges integral, of the piecewise constant x process against the function of bounded variation, which is uh, the co-bracket process here. So it's a pathwise Stitches integral. And note again that this upper index of integration t here appears through this infimum uh, operation for the increments. Okay. Let me call this guy here on the right-hand side just BT, as just to shorten the notation. So that's the BT process. And what I have to show, of course, but let me say it again, this is a process which is a bounded variation process and starts in zero. And what I have to show is that if I take the product of the Z process, so my new martingale, with the N process, with the test Martingale, and if I subtract this process BS as a process in, in the time parameter S, which is of bounded variation, that this thing gives me a martingale. If that's the case, then I have identified the B process as the compensator for the product of these two, and by uniqueness, this compensator must be the bracket. But the, the BS here is a Stilges integral, so therefore the compensator is in fact the Stilges integral, and, and hence the Z process satisfies exactly the abstract condition for the Ito integral that was the basis of our construction, or the basis of our abstract construction. Okay. And here, 
I want again to, to in order to show that this is a martingale. I want to again to show or want to pick out a, a special case which is good enough to show the mechanics of the argument. Namely, let's now take an arbitrary time point S, which, for instance, lies between two time points. And in fact, here it's uh, not necessary uh, to assume that uh, it's strictly in between two time points. So it could be also just as good as to assume that it could be uh, one of the Greek points, for instance. Okay. So, and I want to pick, I want to show now that this product of the Z and the N process subtracted by the BS process, if I condition, or if I take the condition expectation to the sigma field at time TK, I want to show ultimately that this is the Z process multiplied with the N process subtracted by the B process at the times at the time TK. That's clearly the equality which I need to show in this case if I want to convince myself that at least in this particular case of S and TK, uh, the Martingale uh, property is true. Okay, so let's do that. Now, um, <clears throat> the ZS NS process minus the BS process. So if we look uh, what we have in this situation, Uh, wait a second, I need to uh, recollect the argument here. Right, so <clears throat> starting with this here, I first realized that the difference between the Z process at time S and the Z process at time TK is just uh, practically the difference of two sums where the there is one additional summand which appears in the ZS representation, which is the summand which belongs to the last sum in the ZS value, which is the product of XK, which is the value of the X process, on the interval from TK to TK plus 1, and this is multiplied with the increment of the M process on this truncated time interval, so it's the difference of ms and mtk. That's the last summand in the definition of the zs process, which differs uh, from the sum which we show, which we have when we evaluate the ztk, when we evaluate the z process in time tk. But this, all these summands which appear in the value of ztk up, uh, are measurable by construction with respect to the sigma field at some tk. So therefore, this part can be taken out, out of this uh, product, and what remains here is just the condition expectation of the end process. So let me say it again. So I'm writing the z as the sum of the ztk plus one additional sum, summand, the ztk as a factor in this product goes out to the front of the condition expectation, and what remains is the product of the last summand with this ns guy, which uh, was just uh, the expansion of the first mm -hmm. term here in this conditional expectation. And for the second term, I'm doing a similar thing. I just recall that the bs is basically the b at moment tk, plus one additional term, which is the value of the X process, times this increment on the interval. And again, by measurability, here's the increment of this co-bracket process, and again, by measurability of the uh, BTK uh, sum with respect to the sigma field at time TK, this is unaffected by the conditional expectation operation. Okay, now, the first, if I go for the next line, here this condition expectation can be computed obviously right away because I was uh, here testing with a martingale. So therefore this condition expectation is n at tk. And the first factor is not uh, disappeared. I rearrange a little 
and write this BTK um, further to the front of this uh, of these uh, terms. And what remains is then uh, the XK, which was coming from the condition expectation uh, here, which again by measurability and predictability, in fact, of the XK uh, goes to the front. And what remains here is this difference of the MS martingale. And here I add and subtract for the N factor, which appears here, I again subtract and add the value of N at time TK, which I correct by uh, adding the missing term. So I write out the term that I inserted here with a minus sign with a plus sign, which is then this increment of the martingale times N at TK, given at TK. Okay. And the other term, the, the, the term which was missing here, which was still uh, st st here, uh, at the end of this um, quantity, he, for that condition expectation, I realized that the XK again can go to the front of the condition expectation. And I'm dealing with the condition expectation of the increment of this bracket process. Okay, so the next step uh, is uh, an application of what I probably by bad, by bad um, nomenclature um, uh, called the Pythagorean theorem for martingales, which tells me that the expectation of this product of the increments is just as good as the expectation of the increment of the bracket process. That's an immediate consequence of the compensator property of the bracket process for these uh, for this uh, product factor. So this is an direct uh, replacement, if you like, from here to here by using a version of the Pythagorean theorem, if you like, for martingales, in this case for the uh, co-bracket of the martingales. And uh, the next operation or manipulation that I apply to this uh, expression here is just uh, the fact that the NTK is measurable with respect to the FTK sigma field, so it goes into the front, this is what I wrote out here, and then I'm left with the conditional increment of the M process, which is of course zero. And now if I compare what I have, I have a zero here, I have the XK times the conditional increment of the bracket process, and uh, this is exactly, this term here is exactly cancelled by the same term, but with a minus, which was the difference of the B processes. And hence, I in fact have the zero that I wanted to see for all remaining terms except for this product of Z and N at time TK subtracted by um, B TK. So this shows in fact these martingale equality for the product of Z and N after subtraction of the B process in the special case when I deal with a time point S which lies above a certain value of TK and I want to project to the value TK. For general time points uh, S and T, where S less equal to T, the, the argument is essentially the same and I uh, spare the details, but uh, the argument is really exactly the same. So therefore, I see that the bracket of the Z and the N process is exactly the B process, which is uh, the second claim that I needed to show in order to ultimately conclude that, in fact, the stochastic integral of X against M in the case when X is elementary and predictable is exactly our stages integral. I have shown this in the case when x is bounded and when m is, for instance, a square integral of martingale, but the general case for m being just a local martingale and x being just, if you like, locally bounded and elementary predictable. It's just the same. It's obtained by stopping and reduction to this argument here through a um, stopping time argument, which is something that we did now several times, and I don't want to fill in those details. I'll leave it to you to convince yourself that it's, it's doable. 
Okay, so this uh, previous theorem or proposition told us that in case when the X prime is very simple, the abstract stochastic integral exactly is exactly what we want. And in order to deal with more complicated integrant processes, and uh, we have now a very useful uh, argument or a useful um, theorem, which in fact allows us to make statements about more complicated integrants by approximation. And the theorem that we want to use here is the dominated convergence theorem for the Eto stochastic integral. It goes like follows, namely that M be a local martingale and Xn a sequence of measurable processes of whatever type, which are uniformly bounded, say. And suppose that for all pairs t and omega, we have pointwise convergence of the x and t values, event x and t omega values to a certain random variable x t of omega. Then the sequence of stochastic integrals that we that we construct with the sequence of integrands xn converges to the stochastic integral of the x process with respect to the m process locally uniformly in probability. And uh, this, to recall, means that for all positive or non-negative t in full epsilon, the probability of having a deviation uniformly in time of the stochastic integral of xn integrated against m from the stochastic integral of x integrated against m of more than epsilon when we consider the supremum over the time interval from 0 to t that the probability of such a deviation converges to 0 when n tends to infinity. So that is local, this is uniformly in time because we take the supremum with respect to the time variable, and then we take a convergence in probabilities. With some, it's, it's the convergence of probability here that effectively we, we are dealing with because we ask for deviations and probability for deviations so and so forth. So it's convergence of probability. Uh, so we this uh, is the statement here that this sequence of stochastic integrals converges locally uniformly to the stochastic integral that we take with respect to the limiting integrand yes that this is a convergence uh, in, in this fashion okay we prove this uh, by a localizing argument as follows so let tau k be a localizing sequence of uh, stopping times recall that m here in this proposition is considered to be a local martingale so we have a sequence of a uh, localizing sequence of, in such a way that the corresponding stop processes are uh, martingales, the stopping stop process M. And when we consider the quantity that is in the claim, but now still for two different uh, approximation values N and M, and we ask for a maximal uh, deviation by more than epsilon, the probability for such a thing to happen is decomposed into the sub-event whether or not the stopping time at a certain time index k is above or not uh, the level t. So either the stopping time is still below the level t on a certain omega, or it is not, in which case this supremum is taken um, over a time interval where the stopping hasn't yet kicked in. And that's why we can replace those quantities which appear here in the inequality with the quantities which belong to the stopped process M. This is correct because this uh, we, we consider this quantity now on the sub-event that the stopping time tau k is greater than T, which is corresponds to the fact that the stopping in these quantities is not yet uh, is not yet visible, at least when I consider the quantities only up to level t. So that's why in this second inequality I can deal equivalently with the stopped process M. 
which uh, is useful because the stop process M uh, is a martingale. Okay, so I get continue in this sequence of inequalities with the first quantity unchanged. In the second quantity, I do a Chebyshev inequality. I replace this probability of a deviation by an expectation which involves the square of the random variable. The square of the random variable involves the expectation squared of the pathwise supremum of a continuous martingale up to a certain time tau, or t here, t. And uh, for that case, I have dupe maximal inequality, which tells me that the supremum, the pathwise supremum in L2 norms, say, of a, of a martingale is bounded by the expected value of this martingale at terminal time to the power 2. But by the compensated property, I can replace this uh, squ square of this martingale, and it's the difference of these two stochastic integrals, by the bracket process of this difference of these two stochastic integrals, but the bracket process of these two stochastic integrals is nothing but the difference of these two processes squared by our representation of the bracket process integrated against the bracket of the martingale. So here we use either, if you like, the Ito isometry, that's probably the better, best way to say it, that we, yeah, right, that if you like, this is the Ito isometry, which tells me that the L2 norm squared of a stochastic integral is the same as the, the, the bracket process at the end point of this, um, pro, uh, of this um, time interval, which is given by the bracket process at this end point of this time interval, and the bracket process is uh, by the representation just given as this square of the integrand against the integrator in Stieltjes integral. Uh, and if I, which I can do, assume without loss of generality that the stopping time is tau k is also the same as if I take the infimum of all times uh, when the bracket process has exceeded the first time a certain value k. So you can assume this or you can write this, you can call this a tau k prime and work with a tau k prime instead. Uh, then I can now use, uh, in fact, plain Lebesgue-dominated convergence for this sequence of integrands, which are integrated with respect to a Stieltjes integral. So dominated convergence for the Stieltjes integral of the Stieltjes measure tells me that this quantities converge to zero if I send n and m to zero. This is because xn and xm are converging uh, to zero for n and m, so the difference of the two converges to zero uh, when n and m tend to zero because it's just a piece why a, a pointwise convergent Cauchy sequence, and it is uh, bounded uh, by a quantity which, uh, well, but by two times c when c was the quantity which was uh, at the beginning of the statement was assumed to be an upper bound for the, all the relationships of this x process. And uh, so, by a plain application of dominant convergence for the classical Stieltjes integral here, I obtain that this is a sequence conversion to zero. And hence, I have convinced myself that if I choose k large enough in order to have this number here less or equal than a certain threshold, then this other quantity on the right-hand side for this fixed k can be made arbitrarily small when n and m is sufficiently big. So hence, I obtain that this is a Cauchy sequence. And then, um, right, by the usual arguments, uh, this Cauchy sequence is then identified, and I have a, sequ a convergence towards this limiting element uh, also with respect to this topology which I have introduced at the beginning. And uh, as a consequence of this, we can uh, finally, if you like, uh, complete this uh, list of first properties of the stochastic integral uh, in the following way, namely let x be a measurable locally bounded process with left continuous paths, which is the standard case of a predictable process, and let m be a local martingale, then for a certain grid delta, I can consider these discrete in time approximations of what I would want to be the Stieltjes integral, then as a corollary, we obtain that this sequence of processes, K 
converges in fact to the stochastic integral of x with regards of, to the m process locally uniformly in probability so exactly in the same type of topology that we have considered now before if the mesh size of this time grid from where, from where the time parameters ti are taken if this mesh size converges to zero why is this now a plain corollary well it's a plain corollary because these uh, time discretized approximations or grid discretized approximation of this Stieltis integral, they correspond exactly to, as we had just shown, to a, a proper stochastic integral. If we take as an integral these piecewise step functions, which are obtained by replacing the x process by a piecewise in time, a piecewise in time constant function with these half open time intervals that correspond to the grid points ti from delta, where on each of these half open time intervals we replace or we um, choose as the x value or the value of the x of n approximation exactly the value of the left continuous process on the left boundary point of these time intervals. And by left, uh, left continuity of the trajectories, this will be an approximation for all t and omega of the x process, and it's just an application of the previous uh, lemma about the approximation of or dominant convergence, in fact, that we have convergence uh, towards the stochastic integral. Uh, well, since xn converges to x. Okay, so this was really uh, the tough part of today's lecture. We just uh, final finish uh, this this lecture with uh, collecting uh, what we can say now. We want to extend, namely, one little step further the notion of a stochastic integral when the integrator is more than just a martingale and for that we um, or more than just a local martingale for that purpose we allow for one more generalization which is the concept of a semi-martingale which uh, will be the maximal set of integrators which which we shall work ultimately namely a process s which is defined on a filtered probability space which is filtered in continuous time is called a semi-martingale if we have a local martingale and a continuous, and here I shall always assume that all my integrator processes, in particular my martingales, unless I otherwise state, are continuous. And so if there is a local continuous martingale and a continuous process A of bounded variation, which starts in zero, such that the process or the realizations of the process or the trajectories of the process can be realized as the sum of two processes, namely the this martingale process and the process A of bounded variation. And we can easily show, as we have used already a couple of times effectively, that such a decomposition necessarily must be unique because all martingales which are continuous and also of bounded variation must be necessarily of zero quadratic variation, but if they start in zero, then this must be the zero process. So therefore, such a decomposition of any local process, which has a local martingale part and a part of bounded variation which starts at zero, must be unique. And then we will define as the stochastic integral with respect to a continuous semi-martingale the following. And if we do have a continuous semi-martingale and x measurable locally bounded process, then we define as the stochastic integral with respect to the semi-martingale, just the sum of the two integrals which we have at our disposal for the two constituent parts of S, namely, so if you think of this as being the some sort of a Stieltis integral, so just this, you know, if you think about this portfolio situation, you want that this measures somehow the total gains or losses that you see uh, as a result of your portfolio strategy, then if your process that models your stock is a superposition of a martingale and a process of bounded variation, but X is your portfolio strategy, then the total gains and losses are the sum of the gains and losses which are uh, realized by the changes of the martingale part and the gains and losses which are obtained by the changes of the part of bounded variation. So 
in the end you have the sum of two integrals where the first part here is the stochastic integral with respect to a local martingale that we have discussed now at reasonable length. And the second part is just the Steelchis integral that you compute in a path by path fashion, which is doable because A is a process which has um, paths of bounded variation. So that will be our notion of a stochastic integral with respect to a general semi martingale, namely with respect to a process which has a, a unique martingale part and a unique part of bounded variation. And if you think of the dupe decomposition of a sub or something like this, uh, this, this um, is the analog of, uh, of the situation that we encounter in continuous time when we have processes which allow for a decomposition into a martingale part and into a part of bounded variation. And as for notation, x dot s, the dot notation will now be replaced by an integral notation which is more reminiscent of the Stieltjes integral, and we have given evidence and uh, arguments why using this symbol is justified because it shares a lot of features of the Stieltjes integral, uh, although the construction is, is, is clearly more complicated. And uh, also for this uh, integral in the classical pathwise Stieltjes sense with respect to a process of bound variation, we also sometimes no use the dot notation. So in other words, Whenever we write a dot, or a, we can interpret this as a generalization of the Stieltjes integral, which will be in fact no generalization when the integrator is of classical bounded variation. And uh, we have then, as we have already uh, basically uh, indicated at, in the previous lecture, we have an associativity law for this stochastic integral whether or not it is a plain Stieltjes or a plain Ito or a combined Ito and Stieltjes integral as follows. If we have two measurable and locally bounded processes and a semi martingale then the stochastic integral which is obtained by integrating, let's say, the Y process against the semi martingale is again a semi martingale And if we use that new semi martingale for the next level of stochastic integration, this is just as good as taking the product of the two integrants and integrate this only once with respect to this semi -martingale. This is a direct consequence of the associativity law of both for the stochastic integral and for the Stieltjes integral. So it's just the sum of the two properties in common uh, in, in one line, which uh, guarantees the validity of this statement. And I leave that as an exercise. Okay. So we approach the end point of today's lecture, which will is a, which is just a summary, and which goes like follows. So if X is a measurable and locally bounded process, and if S is a semi martingale, and I should have introduced this properly, so this curly S will be our symbol for the collection of continuous semi-martingales uh, on a given filtered probability space, then x dot s is called the Ito stochastic integral of x with respect to this semi-martingale s. And we have the following properties, namely x dot s, so this stochastic integral, is the sum of the two stochastic or Stieltjes integrals in the case when the semi-martingale is in fact a sum of two non-trivial components. We have this law of associativity, and uh, the next property, which is in, fa is in fact, as we had seen, a unique characterization, at least for the case when S is a martingale, is that this bracket of the new stochastic integral with any local martingale is just as good as if we take the bracket of the stochastic integral of X with respect to the martingale part of the same martingale alone. This is because the integral of X with respect to the A part is again of bounded variation and the part of bounded variation will only contribute a zero term to the joint bracket with another process of non uh, of, of any um, finite quadratic variation. So therefore the only part that contributes to the joint bracket with another martingale will be the part that actually comes from a martingale in this 
sum of two processes, so therefore only the martingale part of the stochastic integral will contribute to the joint bracket with any other martingale. And we had seen that they had this, or well, we had basically used this characteristic or characterizing property that this joint bracket is representable as a conventional stages integral of the X process with respect to the joint bracket of the integrator with the test of martingale. And finally, we have seen that if X is an elementary predictable integrate integrand, then this stochastic integral coincides with the naive and proper, in this case, a Stieltjes integral, which is perfectly defined for such simple stochastic, for such simple piecewise constant uh, processes. Okay, so that's the conclusion of today's lecture, which was, again, quite quick. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the main message was probably understandable, and I would recommend to go through, through some of the details of this uh, presentation a couple of times, and we will discuss it also in the tutorial class. The next uh, lectures will be devoted to the um, Ito lemma, or chain rule for stochastic integrals, and applications to finance, and then ultimately we will turn to the um, class of stochastic differential equations as we had discussed in the motivation section of this chapter.